Hello and welcome to this Royal Television Society panel for a new drama called Floodlights, which is coming soon to BBC Two and BBC iPlayer. And it tells the really powerful, moving and important story of Andy Woodward, who is a former professional footballer, whose courageous revelations about the sexual abuse he suffered as a youth player really did send shockwaves through the world of football and also right across the globe, actually. I'm your host, Victoria Derbyshire, I'm a journalist, and today we're gonna to be speaking to the cast and the creative executives behind the drama. Here's a trailer for the film. Do you think you're good enough to be one of my boys? I'm the star maker, son. He really, really rates you, baby. <laughs> a boy whose dream was twisted into a 30-year nightmare. Why did you leave City, Barry? I mean, big club, that. Died at Chelsea in 71. Kept coaching until 94. That's loads of boys. A man whose courage changed our national game. Floodlights. Watch on BBC Two and iPlayer. So, let me introduce Gerard Kearns, who plays Andy Woodward. Jonas Armstrong, who plays Barry Bennell. Writer, Matt Greenhouse. Director, Nick Rowland. And executive producer, Colin Barr. Gentlemen, hello, welcome. Colin, if I could start with you, um, can you tell us how this project came about? Yeah, it was about four and a half years ago or so, um, uh, when I first met Andy, just after the story had broken, when he um, first um, came out and made the allegations public, which of course you'll remember, um, because he, he spoke to you about, about um, those things. And um, Andy and I had a, we had a sort of mutual friend who thought that his story um, would make a good film. And she knew that I worked in the, in the world of factual drama. And so she thought that we should meet. So Andy and I met for breakfast in a hotel in King's Cross. And um, he talked and told me the story. And he just talked for three hours. And, um, and I left that meeting feeling absolutely certain that there was a film to be made and that it was a film to be made that would do something that news coverage, um, talk shows, um, documentaries couldn't do, which was take an audience back to the moments in Andy's life when he was 11, 12, 13, and these things were, were happening. And to take an audience inside the family um, as those things were happening as well, and to really understand how Benel did the things that he did. Um, and it's one of the areas that drama can do things that documentary and sometimes factual television can't do on its, on its own. And then I left there and spoke to Matt um, uh, about it, and he responded to the material in exactly the same way that I did. And, um, and we started writing the script. And Matt, how did you respond? How, how, I mean, I'm guessing you were aware of the story, but how, how did it make you feel when Colin talked to you about potentially doing a drama? Well, uh, Colin and, and Sue had this amazing story idea document um, that actually blew me away emotionally. And uh, it was full of Andy quotes from, I imagine that meeting that Colin's just discussed. Um, and they came up to Manchester, which producers don't often do, you know, to, especially drama producers. They don't come to Manchester to meet people. So I knew they were serious and we sat down and I still came away not totally 100% convinced that I wanted to do it because of it's so heavy. I mean, so heavy. But that document which they collated didn't leave my mind. It kept coming back to me whilst I was writing other things. And in the end, I just had to submit and say, this has just got to be done. And it was because Andy's character came out so brilliantly in that, docu in that document that I just think I, I could feel it. And that's when you know you've got to go. Right. Gerard, why did you want to play Andy? Um, I... I, I it came from the script um, and the opportunity. Um, it, it's a very powerful script and it's a heartbreaking story. Um, and I had such a reaction to it, reading it. Um, 
as an actor, I got the opportunity eventually to, to go in the room and audition for it. And when you were reading the script, what was your reaction? What did happen? I was just in shock. I was just in shock. And I think I was, I, it, it was very last minute how it came about. It's, um, so from reading the script and then reading it, knowing I, would, I was going to be going into the room, you're auditioning for Andy. Um, I think Sunday night to Monday when, when I went in the room and, and met Nick and Colin and um, and Shaheen, um, it, it, it just kind of, you know, the, the character of Andy and, and the writing, it, it was almost out of my hands. It just took us all, I think, yeah. to, to, to a very emotional place. Jonas, what, what, what did you feel when you read the script? I thought it was um, extremely powerful and affecting and really poignant and shocking as well. That's what I initially thought when I first read the script. In terms of playing Barry, well, I mean, talk us through how you decided to portray him. Well, initially, I've worked with Nick. We worked together on uh, Ripper Street for BBC and Netflix like six years ago, and we've got a good working relationship, you know. And I'm, I'm I, I know Matt's work also, and he's a fantastic writer. Um, initially, um, I was set to to have a Zoom conversation like this with with Josh and also Nick to potentially play Andy, and um, the night before. My agent called and said, either it was Nick or Josh, I think it was Nick, said, um, Nick has an idea about you maybe wanting to meet for or potentially meeting for to play Barry. And I have to say, first of all, I was like, I, I don't want to do that. But I had a good discussion with my agent. And then I decided, yeah, I'm going to go for this. Purely, well, because of the fact of this is an extraordinary piece and it's to raise awareness for people who, who might be still suffering and the piece is that strong. And I kind of had to take my self back and had to put the project forward before myself as a performer, as an actor, if that makes sense. And I thought, you know, without sounding cliche, but this story needs to be told. And if I can help facilitate that in any way, shape or form, I'm, I'm all for it. And after we had the Zoom conversation, um, I was, during that process, you know, um, I was 100% committed and I was telling these guys, telling Nick and telling Josh, saying, look, I can do this. You know, I can bring this to it. I can bring that to it. And um, yeah, so that's how I came around. And the next day I was calling my agent saying, you know, we've got to push for this. We've got to push for this because I want to, you know, I want to do this tough as it's going to be and tricky as it's going to be. But, you know, I can, I, I can do something with this and bring some, some truth to the story. It's interesting that your first reaction, though, <coughs> the potential of playing Barry Bunnell was no way. Why? why? Why was that your gut, do you think? Because I didn't know, because it, it, it kind of made me feel a bit sick, you know, having to, to play some of these scenes out. Um, but then talking to Nick and Josh and saying, look, well, these things will be put in place to, to make you feel comfortable um, and also everybody else on set to, to, to be comfortable. And yeah, and, and also as well, just getting into the, the mind of somebody that's capable of doing that. It's not a pleasant, it wasn't a pleasant place, place to be, you know? Um, so that was why I had that initial response, you know? And still, you know, as, as, as we, we were shooting, I was, it was still, it was massively affecting, I'm sure for Gerard and everybody that, that was involved, but you kind of have to, remove that from, from your ego or, or whatever and, you know, push towards the project and, and, and the outcome and how, how that's going to help people, you know. Nick, what kind of things then did you put in place, as Jonas was just suggesting, to, to make people feel comfortable? I mean, it, you know, obviously we had things like intimacy coordinators and we had, um, you know, uh, therapists and everyone on hand like that. Um, 
all sort of well well being stuff was all taken care of really well by the production company and the BBC. Um, but in terms of like, you know how he, how the set is run, it was just so important that there was a, you know, it is such a tough story, and the nature of some of the scenes was so emotionally challenging. Um, it, it was just really important that there was a there was a really safe environment on set and a really supportive environment on set. Um, you know, especially with the cast, but you know, for the whole crew, it was a real it was a real challenge. Um, and so much of it is actually done before any of us get on set. It's about bringing the right group of people together. Um, and what, although although the story was was very challenging to make, it's probably the best filmmaking experience I've had because the collective love and support all the way through the cast and crew was something you could really feel every day. Every day, everyone turned up knowing that we were trying to do something important and on the hard days I think that that sort of family atmosphere sort of pulled us through really. Right. And the therapists that you mentioned that they were available for everybody the actors the young actors the crew? Yeah absolutely um, it, it was about you know it's, it's not something that was sort of forced upon you but if you felt like you you wanted um, you know you wanted support then it was there and I think that's a really you know really um, you know, I don't think you could make, you know, you, you couldn't do a production like this without that sort of um, stuff in place. Yeah, I mean, that it's really interesting. I, uh, Colin, Matt, Nick, you, I don't know how long you've been in this business, years, you know, very, very experienced, but going back a decade even, that kind of stuff wouldn't have been available, would it, Colin? No, I mean, honestly, I, I, I would say three years ago, a lot it's... of that stuff wouldn't have been available. I think our understanding of these things in the last few years has just um, it's just accelerated so much, and and it's um, it's difficult, you know, making sure these things are available and making sure everyone feels able to use them if they need them, affording it, you know, it needs people to really commit to doing it to make it possible, and not just to use the language of duty of care and welfare, because for a long time it felt to me that like people used the language but didn't really see it through. And I think now it feels like production companies, broadcasters, everybody are really seeing it through now and, and seeing just how important it is for, for everyone. And that's the production team as well. Um, and and I, think, um, I think there's also a willingness on the part of people to, to use it. I used it for the first time ever, actually, on, on this production. Um, I think for the first time in my career, I felt I needed to, to talk to someone. And... Um, and it was it was easy to do, and it helped. Did anyone else make use of the therapist? If you don't mind me asking, you don't have to tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Um, and the lady that, that I spoke to, Lou, if you don't mind saying her name, you know, she was she was brilliant. She was fantastic. And you know, I didn't know how how, how the conversation would begin or how it would ebb and, you know, but, but then before you knew it, 45 minutes were up and you've let off all this stuff and then you feel settled at the end of it. So for me personally, it did help tremendously and made me feel less apprehensive about, you know, because I think as, as, as you know, as an actor for myself, you build things up massively, you know, and they just got dispelled, you know, to a certain extent, <clears throat> you know, and I was going on to, to, to do my job and, that's just what I had to do. But yeah, she was, she was fantastic. So she helped me very much so. Matt, can I ask you, when you were talking to Andy Woodward ahead of writing the script, I mean, how, how long did you spend with him? How, how did you, at the end, did you think I must include that? I'm going to leave that though. I mean, how do you, how do you kind of rationalize it? Well, we didn't have a manuscript. We didn't have a book. So everything we were getting was from, you know, Myself or Danny Taylor's articles, or what Colin and Sue had already gleaned from Andy in those first few meetings. So it was literally all the information I had to get out of Andy, which was difficult because you don't want to go in and say, Oh, tell me about it, you know, because that would be absolutely awful for him and awful for us. So it was a case of making sure we got the structure right, understanding the story, where we wanted to go, where we didn't want to go, 
and then targeting the questions. And then we got Andy in, um, in a room for about three days and asked him these questions because everything I wanted to ask him, I wanted to make sure he informed the story and we just didn't go widespread and go into all the dark recesses, which you can go. So, I mean, and that was a great bonding moment for us. By the way, that's, those questions did end up going like that. So even when you targeted it, it was, um, it still spread massively. So that, that, was, that was a good moment, but I mean, absolutely just draining and shocking, but for bonding and, and, and getting into that mind of Andy and then having the confidence then to translate that to words in a script. Uh, it was absolutely crucial. Yeah. And do you remember, Matt, we were, so, sorry, Victoria, but do you remember, Matt, we had that decision about whether, do we do it all in one concentrated burst yeah. or do we do it over a longer period of time? And yeah. we took a long time. We talked to Andy about what he wanted. We obviously sought professional advice about all of that as well. And then the conclusion of that was to do it all in one concentrated burst of three days. But... Um, I wasn't involved in those interviews. It was um, Matt and a producer called Susan North. But you can imagine what that must have been like in those three days. I know for Andy, it was incredibly grueling, but he was, in, he was also really grateful to do it like that rather than having to revisit it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, Gerald, can I ask you about the responsibility that I'm guessing you will have felt, and you tell me if I'm wrong, in taking on this role and playing this man that you have met who went through these horrific experiences as a boy? Yeah, that massive responsibility. Um, that I think what Jonas and yourself touched on, um, kind of pre-production, um, you know, it, it was like six days turnaround. So first of all, having someone to kind of offload and um, that too, with regards to talking, was fantastic and a really good opportunity. Um, yeah, a massive res responsibility. Um, and oh. go on, sorry. Was was Andy on set? Some the whole of it, some of it, or not at all? Yeah. So when um, when I got um, offered the part, it, it was a case of um, reading reading Andy's book. Um, meeting Andy and getting a shooting script in that order. <laughs> so, uh, and then, you know, they're going through the hair and makeup, costumes. So, it, it, just as soon as it was a go, and, and I got a call um, f from from Matt and, um, you know, talking to Nick. And it, it was just, it, so it was, it was overwhelming. Um, but this, it was, it was very, um, I was excited as well because it was a fantastic, fantastic script. And then meeting Andy and knowing that we had his, you know, complete support and cooperate, but that was, that's, that's just amazing to not, to have that reassurance, making a film about someone and then encouraging you, supporting you, want, you know, wanting you to do, to do a good job. Um, that, that, that was, that was really empowering. Um, mm. So we went into the shoot knowing that, you know, we, we had Andy's support and that, that really brought such an energy to it. It was fantastic. That is massive to have his, his backing. Um, Jonas, I've spoken to um, Andy and some of the other men who were sexually abused by Barry Bennell when they were boys and, and they have seen a preview and they said that your portrayal was so accurate. I mean, it, it, it kind of took them aback. How did you, how did you sort of get the balance right between the, a man who is vile and sinister, but also really charismatic and was able to groom parents? Yeah, this, this was the main thing which I wanted to find. And when I first spoke to Andy, you know, the conversation we had, um, we talked about uh, Bernal's switch, there'd be, there'd be a very, very apparent big switch between, you know, the kind of charismatic demeanor, the charming demeanor, the laddish demeanor, you know, 
banter, lads, football, all this. And then he said his eyes would just change. They'd almost go black. And then he'd, he'd hone in almost, well, on his prey, essentially. So they was trying to find that. And I spoke, I spoke to Nick about that. And there were certain physical things, which he did as well, which Andy, you know, let me know about. Um, you know, Benel's from Manchester. He's got a similar accent to mine. There's very limited, you know, footage you can find um, on YouTube. But there was there's two there's two short clips of of when he's been interviewed about certain things. So I was trying to figure out a voice for for him, and the pitch. I wanted it. I, I didn't want to sound. I didn't want to just step it step into it and sound like myself. Even though it's similar to me, I had to be able to distinguish my voice with his. Do you know what I mean? And I think that I've, I found that. But even, even talking to Andy, Andy said, you know, it's not dissimilar to yours, but I think just personally for me, I wanted to find that. And then also just, just having that, you know, this is a conversation I had with, with Nick and Josh in, in the Zoom meeting before, you know, because I, I'd been brought up around football. You know, my mates, are some of my friends have played professional football. And I, I brought on one of my friends who was the football um, coordinator on this. So it's, it's bringing that kind of likable persona that kids would gravitate towards. It's having that energy, that, that abundance of energy and confidence and knowing, again, in, in the audition, I think I was, <laughs> I was trying too hard with the family. And Nick said, look, he doesn't need to be wanting the family to, to, to you know, coerce the family in. You know, he's already charmed them. He just needs to sit, step back. And that, that was... That was part of the mass that he had. So it was, it was finding all these different levels, you know, and, and finding him being calculating and showing that, and then it would just drop, and then the real fellow would come through. So it was, it was finding that. That's, that's kind of how I went about it in a long-winded term. No, no, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think film is set in two different times. What, what is that like to direct? Uh, it's, you know, it's just it's an added challenge, you know, especially, you know, we, we had, you know, we had sort of modest resources and, and, and time. So it, it put a huge amount of strain on, um, on how we could, you know, show off these different time periods. Um, but we had an amazing, amazing set of uh, heads of department. And, um, you know, it's that sort of classic thing of like, when you, when you have restrictions and obstacles, it can make you more creative than, um, Although we couldn't, you know, we had to be very selective with how we did, you know, scenes of football, for example, things like that were a challenge because, uh, um, you know, we didn't have the time to sort of choreograph them or have huge sort of set piece moments. But what we could do is is just try and build as much detail into the frame as possible. So, you know, Andy gave us, um, you know, lots of photographs, lots of, you know, old kits, and we just tried to build as much truth into the detail as possible and you know even down to like in 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 Andy's bedroom in that in the 1980s in the film we have his um we have his real trophies that he had as a kid that he donated for the filming and just little little things like that that you know I think is really useful for the authenticity but it's also really helpful for the cast as well to kind of have these sort, sort of connections to Andy yeah. and um but yeah it was you know, it was um, every day. It was a, a relief to get to the end of it because there were there were tough days. But like I say, you know the, um, you know we had, you know when Andy came and and visited set on the day we were sort of shooting the some of the football scenes in Berry Stadium where he used to play for, and it was just, you know, it, it was such a an ama a very emotional day for everyone. Um, but Andy was so he was so supportive and, and there was so much love everywhere. It was, it was just, you know, such a great, great experience. Um, I want to ask you about the, the, the young actors, um, the, the actors that played the boys when Andy was a little boy. Um, Colin, I don't know if this is for you or, or, I mean, what is it like when you've got all those, I don't know how old they are. I mean, teenagers, they look like to me, were they? Maybe a bit older, I don't know. Well, actually, I mean, Nick could talk best sort of about this than me, but the actual range of ages is, um, I think we had a, a Max, who played um, young Andy, was 12. Wow. Well, I think he just turned, he's just turning 13, I think. And then the boy who played his best friend in the team, Ash, was actually something like, I'm, I'm not, 
you probably shouldn't say this, but he's probably at 17 or 18, but playing very, very young. And so you actually had a really interesting range of ages who all sort of look and feel about the right age. Yeah. But also, I mean, again, massive duty of care to those those boys. Huge. And and um, uh, I, I was talking to actually Matt, Max's mum last night um, about the experience of it all, because they, they sat down and watched the film for the first time yesterday, in fact. And, of course, Max can't watch the whole film because um in theory it's an 18 um so you can see parts of it he's acted all the way through it but they have to be a bit careful about him watching the the whole thing but his mum and dad watched it and um you know they were just uh, they were quite overwhelmed by it really and um, incredibly proud but i think more than anything they felt like his experience of making it had just been um amazing for for him he'd loved it and he has this amazing trick. Jonas will, again, know this better than I do, but Max has this amazing trick of sort of being the most mature person in the room, <laughs> even when he's the youngest person in the room, and sort of almost looking out for all of the adults to check that they're okay. And oh, um, it's quite an amazing. He did that with you, didn't he, Jonas? He did, bless him. His, um, his chaperone, Mary, came over to me one day and it was one of the more tricky days. It was in, it was in uh, the, the set of Bernal's house and Mary came over to me and, and, and she said, you know, Max is really worried about you. So I got, I got you know, I got, I got worried to thinking, no, what's up with him? And I said, what's going on? What's up? What's happened? What's happened? She goes, no, no, he's really, he's really concerned about how you're doing, Jonas. He's just making sure that you're, that you're all right. So he was brilliant. And I have to say, the lads, when they're on set, when they, they were doing what we had to do and they were very aware you know, massively aware and, you know, they'd knuckle down and, and they, they'd be fantastic, you know, when the camera's rolling. But in between, they were just lads being lads. They were having a great time, you know, and because when we were out on the football pitches, they were kicking, you know, kicking the ball around and we we're having a laugh and it was keeping, it was keeping that, that, that energy that, that Gerard talked about and Nick, you know, it, it was keeping that going because if it had been too serious and, and kind of morose and kind of like this, um, it would have been even more of, of, of a struggle. So, you know, when Nick said in terms of the energy and, and the feeling on set, it was, a, it was a good atmosphere that we had. And that's, you know, a testament to, 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 to the lads because they kept it vibrant, they kept it lively. So it was good. They were great. They really were. But also the impression I'm getting is, is you were all looking out for each other. It's yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, you know, you were all, you've, you've got each other's back on, on what, what must have been some really draining days, you know. Um, can, I, can I just jump in and say, you know, if I can, two-footed tackle it. But I think that's why, you know, Nick brought that. And, you know, the biggest relief for me and, and Colin and Sue was when Nick said yes to this because we'd looked at and spoke to other directors and we never felt... Personally, I never felt someone was going to take it and do it justice and go all in in it, you know. And I think Nick was the only one that said, yeah, I'm going to, I really, really want to do this. We'd just come out of lockdown. Directors were looking at other jobs and how to, you know, feed the kids, whatever. I mean, there was a lot of excuses. But then when we got to Nick, it was such a, it felt so right and it felt such a relief for me, because we'd, we'd waited, we'd, we'd delivered this in May 2019, and then we just got kiboshed because getting this back on track, we couldn't get any kids, we couldn't get any licenses, we couldn't shoot it. So, you know, it, it, it was really fraught. But, um, and that's testament to Nick. And then you get, you know, Jonas, and then you get Jed. It was, um, it, you could feel it really coming together. And a few times I went on set, I could feel that he was doing something special. Nick, you, you might want to respond to that huge compliment there from Matt. Well, yeah, that, that's super, super lovely. And um, especially, you know, it's uh, paying a compliment back. Like that was the first thing when when I got sent the script was that Matt had written it. And I remember, I don't think I've told Matt this, but I um, when I was at film school, I used to watch Control um, his, a film that he wrote um, I'll just watch it and get to the end and just go straight back to the start and watch it again and make notes and things so it was kind of it was very cool to 
to suddenly have the opportunity, uh, you know, to work on one of his projects. But then, you know, and I'd I'd heard about um, I'd heard about Andy, but I didn't know any details. And it was a huge sort of um, education reading the script. Um, and the difference between something like this, which is you know the true experience of of, of somebody compared to you know a, a fictional drama. Well, this this was my first experience of doing a true story, and um, it is it's very very different. On one hand, you have um, I would say much more sort of a lot of pressure and a feeling of responsibility and, and duty. Which is, you know, it's like a whole a whole other layer. Normally, you just you respond to a story and you have your own creative instincts on how you see things. Whereas this was something completely different. Obviously, you have your emotional reaction to the script, but you're trying to. I felt like my job was really to to try and empathise with Andy and understand Andy and communicate that truth to the audience to try and sort of find an objective truth somehow which you're chasing you can never fully get there because i i wasn't there it's not my story it's andy's but it's it but my job felt like it was about trying to do my best to really understand what it felt like for him and to try and you know with the cast and with the crew to try and communicate that in in in, in a truthful way and it's it's kind of a, you know, I, I although there's pressure with that, it's an amazing North Star that keeps you going. You know, normally when any time you're doing, you're creating work, you get the question of well, why, or you should ask yourself, you know, why why is this story being made? Why am I doing this? And with floodlights, it was it was always so clear and so um, so motivating. So uh, you know. It, for me, like I said, it was, it was an amazing experience, and I'm just very, very grateful to everyone and, and, and Andy especially that um, I was able to to work on this. Colin, why is it important that this story is told? Um, there are things we don't want to look at, and there are things we don't want to talk about, and they're often the things that we need to look at and need to talk about. And I think a film like this, um, as difficult as some of it is, it, it, it raises questions. It gets people thinking and talking about something that's quite often brushed to the side or brushed under the carpet. And, and it's in some ways a step towards understanding, maybe healing a bit, but it's not our healing. It's, a, you know, it's the, the people in the film's healing. Um, but it's a step towards stopping it from happening again. Um, but mostly it's about allowing a story like Andy's to be recognised and allowing him to be recognised um, because I think what he did deserves that. Gerard, how do you want people to feel when they're watching this? Um, I just want them to be able to empathise with how how he must have felt not being able to talk to his parents, you know, anyone around, and just feeling that utter loneliness, you know. I think that was the most upsetting thing, playing Andy, was trying to empathise with that utter loneliness. That, that's, that was really, really upsetting. So, you know, anything that can come from that is, um, is, a, is positive, you know? And I, and I also think as well, like, on a really positive note, you could be watching it. I mean, myself with, you know, our youngest, and I, I train him at at football, if there are, you know, people who want to help and can make a difference, do you know, they might go, do you know what, I can, I can, I can be there and I can be a force for good. There's, there's also something, Victoria, there's something as well, and Matt, there's a line that Matt wrote in the film where Andy at one point is talking to Danny Taylor, who 
who broke the story originally. And Danny's asking him why, you know, why he won't talk about these, why he struggles to talk about these things. And he, he, he uses the phrase because he says that I've got children and they think I'm a real man. And Danny says, why aren't you a real man? And Andy says, because real men don't get raped. And I think there was always something in that line that felt like it was a really important truth to get at about um, sexual abuse of men in a masculine environment um, with virtually no women present. Um, all sexual abuse is, is, is horrific. There's something about men and sexual abuse and their inability to talk about it and, and never want to talk about it, which is a very, a very specific thing. Um, which I think Matt managed to get at in the script. Yeah, and then you put that in the football environment oh, God. in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it's it's just, you know, you of course no one talked about it. Of course they didn't, you know? Um, in ter- this might sound an odd question, but in terms of the filming, I want, I want to ask all of you, what, what has stuck in your mind? What has been memorable? You know, it... it I'm not asking you to, to necessarily say something that's intense. It could be something funny or joyful or whatever, just something that you will take away from the actual sort of the filming process. Jonas, let's start with you. Just, um, I think just to reiterate what Nick said about, and, and also Gerard and also Matt, um, that they did, feel like there was a sense of all things coming together at a certain point to make the, the, the film happen at this time, you know? Um, I know that we came on, myself and Gerard, at the, at the latter stages, you know, being cast and stuff. And there was just that sense that, you know, we're, we're, we're really doing this and we're doing it together, you know? And everybody put so much effort into it, you know? when Nick talked about limited resources and stuff like that, we didn't, we weren't aware of that. We were just coming on and giving it all we could on a daily basis and filming, you know, trying to get everything and cramming stuff in at the end of the day, getting as much footage as we possibly could to make it the best possible film that we could. And there was a real sense of that, you know, of, of togetherness. And that's, that's what I would take away from it, I, I, I think, yeah. Anyone else? I, I, or you would, Nick? Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, for me, the most memorable day was also one of the hardest days, which was, I think, um, in the third, it was, a, it, was, it was a 20 day shoot. So it was really, it was really quick. And it was sort of, we're in week three. And, um, and I think Jared and I were both quite emotionally exhausted at, at this point. And we did, uh, we were doing this, this really emotional scene. And, and uh, to begin with, uh, Jared wasn't feeling it. it was Jared's the, the, the FaceTime in the bedroom scene and and um and Jared was like, wasn't feeling it and I was sort of giving him a pep talk and we were sort of had our arms around each other and um trying to sort of build build each other up and then and then when we finished that scene I was so moved by by Jared's performance I was so I just was so emotional and then but because you know the schedule was quick we had to go straight into the next thing and I just couldn't it's like I you know when you sort of get tunnel vision and you, I couldn't think properly and I was there sort of blocking the scene with with the other actors and I literally just lost my head for a moment and I just had to sort of have this uh, have this sort of pause where I kind of you know just sort of decompressed from that scene and then it was Jared who was supporting me and he had his arm around me this time. And just the kind of, the sort of, the, the book ending of that scene, how we sort of were there for each other, will, I'll always remember um, and always appreciate. Wow, yeah, ditto. Cause that, 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 I mean, we'd done, all them scenes were so back to back. So, you know, as, it, it, you know, trying to explore the emotional depths, or, you know, as, as much as you possibly can. For, like you talked about before, about the responsibility, wanting to get that right. And we felt collectively like we were hitting them beats, 
But on that day, I think it was just, I was like, we need to rehearse this. We didn't do much rehearsal, did we? Like, it depended. Some days we felt like we need to go now, you know, um, in, in, in the prison scene. Um, and then other days, or, you know, I was really worried. I was like to Nick, like, how many camera shots? What's the setup? Because, you know, it's, it's not just kind of doing it. What you going again? You know, from all different angles, and you you wanted to catch that emotional truth every time. You know, for the writing, for for you know, for Andy, and and that day I was like, this isn't something we need to. And yeah, it was Nick's, you know, gentleness and reassurance that brought it to the surface. It wasn't kind of the rehearsal or going, no, we need to get this, you know, find it, work it. It doesn't, do you know what I mean? Soft and gentle can be so much more effective. And that's exactly what Nick did. And I don't, don't think he did it intentionally. It wasn't like, you know, strategic or anything. It was just very organic. Um, and, and it was, he, he, he helped me massively, massively. You can't do, you know, you can't do things on your own. You need help from others, whoever you are. Um, and, and that was, that's what, again, I'll take from this shoot that, you know, everyone was there ready to, to be there for everyone, Do you know, genuinely, it was, it was brilliant. I feel like I know Andy's story really, really well, but there was something about watching it that made me shocked and horrified all over again. It was so uh, upsetting to watch, I've got to be honest, Colin, it really was. And I was WhatsApping Andy as I was watching it. Um, and he was saying, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going, wait till you get to the end. And it's very, very, very moving at the end. What is it, Colin, about me visualizing it as a, as a viewer that had that extra impact do you think i think that's drama versus documentary or news in some ways it's um it's the difference isn't it between being told about something and feeling like you're bearing witness to it or or, or feeling it um there's a shot in the film where um we it's that just after the first time that young andy has been um abused by Benno at the house and of course you know we're very careful about what you see but you know what's happened and it cuts to Andy being taken by Benno to Crew's um, stadium in the changing rooms and the way that Nick has um, shot it is we're simply on um, Max's face playing young Andy it's a, it's a slow motion shot and you just sit on his face as he walks through the corridor with Benel shaking the official's hand and you just sit on his face and you read everything into that. And I think there's something for me so haunting about understanding the loneliness and the sense of being trapped that Andy experienced. And a shot like that, or a shot like Andy at the dinner table well, all the adults around him are laughing and joking and eating dinner and he's there alone. Those are the things that I think drama can do that almost no other medium can do. Yeah. In terms of your script, Matt, how, how much of it, I, mean, I don't know if it's even possible to, to say this, but how much of it is actually Andy's own words to you? <laughs> but maybe, I don't know, maybe 5%. I, I, they're all Andy's words in my head. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, because you become all the characters, you know, and even uh, Barry, uh, you have to become them. You have to, to a certain extent, understand them to be able to uh, translate the voices onto the page, uh, to make sense of them, to understand even evil people you've got to try to understand why in order to make the plot work and, and so forth. But, um, you know, when I'm writing the script, really it's just like a pinball machine and I try and get it out longhand and then refine it once I, once I stick it into the uh, computer. So, 
Yeah, but once you've met Andy, once you read, you know, the interviews, yours being the, 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 the biggest, and then, you know, you, you get that voice. And not, I'm a lad from the same era, so it was a, it was a good fit. You know, Northern, uh, late 80s football, I'm your man. Uh, so it wasn't a difficult jump for me to go into Andy's head and understand his background, and, and, and I'd know some of the grounds that he's played on. I obviously knew Stockport, Berry, I'm from Presswich, so it was like it was a, it was a it was a good fit for me um, with Andy straight away, and I think Colin and, and Sue knew that, which is why we got on the train. Okay, um, I want to ask all of you finally: What would you like audiences to take away from this film? I'll start with you, Nick. I think, um, you know, feel empathy and, and, and a greater understanding of what what Andy went through and what other survivors of abuse like this, of what it feels like, really, um, I think, first and foremost, but, but also to understand how, how people like Barry have, have been able to get away with with this and how and you know if, if if this film can sort of highlight that and stop it happening again um you know that that would be such an incredible thing that i think we all want um gerard what would you what, what would you say i think definitely to reiterate what nick said um to to empathize and um try and understand you know how how lonely, um, you know it can be, and um, you know and looking for that opportunity to connect and to talk and to you know to try and understand really. Jonas, what would you say? I think that. It can infiltrate um, anything, you know, any situation, scenario. Um, nobody would have thought that this would have gone on in football, you know, sending their little lads or, or little girls off, off to coach. Um, it's, it's the trust, you know, the trust that the parents had within Pennell. And just, just to massively raise awareness for the fact that this does go on, not just back then, but also in, in, in today's society. And just to, to raise awareness that it is okay to bring it forward and it is okay to talk. And it's like Colin said, you know, the things that should be said are the most difficult things and it's the things that, that, aren't, that aren't said. And I think, yeah, for me, that's, that's paramount. What about you, Matt? Um, well, I'd like to feel a, quite a bit of anger about how this happened. Uh, because let's not forget Dispatches, the documentary that came out, uh, which finger pointed at this a long time ago, how Benel can rob these kids of their lives almost. And then going back to that, you know, secrets for men, you know, that is, it's important that if you get into that stage where you've got to talk, then you can, and there's an outlet for that. And don't, so that people aren't going to graves with secrets. But also at the end, hope, tears of hope. And I'm sure, um, you know, touch wood, I think we'll get them. Colin? Um, I, I think what Matt said about the dispatches is really important. You know, this story was told um, years before um, Andy was able to speak. Obviously, the fact that Andy spoke and identified himself was a big reason that the story got the attention that it did. But I think what the lack of response to that dispatch is spoke to something that I think is still true today to some degree, which is the willingness to blame and be suspicious of victims of abuse who come forward to talk never ceases to amaze me, men or women. And... Um, I've never met a victim of sexual abuse who spoke about it for money, for attention. Um, 
and I hope that the film will reinforce that. Well, thank you very much, all of you. Um, Floodlights is going to be on BBC Two and BBC iPlayer very soon. Thank you, Gerard, Gerard Kearns. Jonas, thank you very much. Jonas Armstrong. Matt, as the writer, thank you. Matt Greenhouse, Nick Rowland, the director, and Colin Barr, executive producer. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best.